Well, we're down to number one. We are down to our number one favorite films of 2020. I'm about to make some people mad jealous with this one because I did get get to see it. I got to see early access. It is a 2020 movie. It might not be getting a mainstream release until 2021, but it was released in a few festivals and for virtual cinema screenings last year. So it is by definition a 2020 movie. My number one favorite film of 2020 is Lee Isaac Chung. Minari. And this is a beautiful film. This comes to theaters on February 12, 2021. Uh, and I'm going to keep people updated because I've had, once I published my favorite films of the list, uh, favorite films of the year list uh, last weekend, I got about six different messages from people, texts and PMs asking me how I saw Minari. I was and, one of them. <laughs> yes. And, and and how I did it though was like I said a big tip of the cap to the ULC Film Center who did an excellent job with uh, allowing people to watch it and stream it for a week. Very selective. I was one of the lucky ones to get to see it, so it's supremely grateful uh, that I did. But Minari, so um, again, comes out February twelfth, twenty twenty one. Highly recommend you check it out, and I think they'll fast track a video on demand release or some sort. They're going to strike a deal, I think, with Hulu or oh. something because it's a it's an A24 product. But the film is really a humanist marvel with its textured portrait of a Korean family. And it's like Terrence Malick. I call it Malickian landscapes, just how beautiful and gorgeous it is. Uh, it focuses on the Yi family's move from California to rural, rural Arkansas. They've downsized to a mobile trailer overlooking acres of farmland at the insistence of the father of the movie uh jacob played by stephen ewan and much that's much to the chagrin of his wife monica uh the family has two kids the precocious older sister Anne, and the wide-eyed absolutely adorable little boy named david played by alan kim plus monica's mother the kid's grandmother who David loves to torment in this movie. And because she's according to the little boy, not like a grandmother and two smells like Korea. <laughs> and it, it, it is, it is adorable. I don't want to get into all the ways he torments her in this movie, but it's, it's precious in some ways. Um, Lachlan Milne gives the picture, the cinematographer gives the picture an angelic sun kissed color palette too, which Lee Isaac Chung bakes in metaphors with the most elegantly simple scenes in the movie, like when the family's struggling to get consistent water, which is the foundation for growth. And this family needs to do a lot of growing as a collective unit. Um, ultimately, it's a movie about assimilation. It's a Korean family's assimilation to a completely different lifestyle. And it's also a father's assimilation into his family because he's so self-centered with this move. And he's so dependent on farming and growing his crops on luscious red dirt soil that only this part of the country provides him. And the movie too gets its title from the resilient Korean herb that grows and thrives wherever it's planted, which is another one of Chung's many metaphors in this film as well. The last thing I'll mention too is Will Patton is in this movie. He plays the neighborhood pastor and I love his character too. And I love more, even more the way Chung articulates him because he's not your typical racist Southerner. He actually works and helps Jacob plant his crops. And he's like almost to a fault supportive of Jacob's ideas and is grateful to be working for him. And is a God fearing man an individualist, but somebody who recognizes community. It's just so refreshing in this culture. When you watch a movie that's set in the South, that doesn't represent Southerners as, as just racist skinheads, which I think is a toxic stereotype that's, you know, has some truth to it, but you see it way too often in movies. And Will Patton gives a lot of really good humanization to this character too. Um, again, Minari is available, uh, will be in theaters, I should say, on February 12th, 2021. But I, I'm willing to bet A24 reading the room on the state of the world with this pandemic is going to fast track some kind of either video on demand release or I would hope, and I think that they will ultimately, uh, because you've seen other streaming services go this route. I got a hunch. I don't know why. I feel it in my bones. I feel it in my bones this movie's going to get a Hulu deal. I have a feeling that this thing is going to be on Hulu by the summertime, and I hope it is because it is a beautiful movie. Stephen Ewan deserves the Oscar nomination for this. 
Uh, I'd honestly love to see him throw Alan Kim in there too. The kid's young, very little, but he's so cute in this movie. And he owns a lot of his one-liners. Uh, there's a great scene with him and his grandmother when his grandmother's like rubbing his shoulders and saying, pretty boy, pretty boy. And he goes, he just gets all mad all of a sudden. He goes, I'm not pretty. I'm good looking. And it's there's so many cute moments in this, and there's so many heart-wrenching moments, too. I don't want to get into the climax, but there were some tears shed. Uh, if you can't avoid the trailer, I'll, I'll add that, too. If you can't avoid the trailer, A24 doesn't bungle trailers, but I would argue they bungled this one. Minari, my number one favorite film of 2020. See it when it comes out next month or down the line in the spring. Man, if there's one oh. thing that pissed me off about 2020 – is like I came off the year where A24 released three movies that were in my best of list: The Lighthouse, Uncut Gems, and Midsummer. Uh, I came off of a year like that, going, "Man, I can't wait to see what A24 does next." And I see Minari lined up and who's in the cast. I'm like, "Okay." And then The Green Knight, and I'm like, "Awesome." And then the pandemic. Wait, what? <laughs> it's just <laughs> like, uh, and I, I didn't get to see any of these movies. And Minari was like definitely the thing, like after hearing it come out on film festivals, because I think they're holding off on Green Knight, um, hearing it come off of festivals, like how much people are loving it, I was dying to see this, and I was utterly jealous of you that you got a screener for it. Yeah, I was so thrilled when I got it. it it's, a, it's a tremendous movie. And to, and to answer your point before we uh, head into your uh, um, number of, N number one pick excuse me uh the green knight is set for a release tentatively on july 30th 2021 okay Dom, you got Dude, any movie that has the american dream in it and then having it be an asian family and then like all these metaphors about like father son like god damn it why is this speaking to me uh, i guess i gotta watch <laughs> it i don't know uh, and then it's about the american oh my god go ahead sorry go ahead number one joe take yeah, it away no yeah. uh, my number one film of 2020 which you can find on a streaming service, is the sequel to Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. It's Soul, where uh, Viola <laughs> Davis's band needed to replace a piano player for some reason, and so they find Joe Gardner, <laughs> voiced by uh, Jamie Foxx. <laughs> uh, no, I'm kidding. Um, Soul is my number one. Uh, this movie is directed by Pete Docter and co-directed by Kemp Powers, who we will be checking out his directorial uh, debut, I believe, uh, coming up very soon on Amazon with One Night in Miami. Uh, you can find this on Disney+. Plus. You don't have to pay for it. It comes with your subscription. And thank God it does because this, to me, was the cherry on top of 2020. Like, that Sunday can have the disgusting flavors. It could be a shit Sunday. Whatever you want it to be, this is, though, the cherry on top. You ended the year at least with this beautiful-looking film. This is Pixar's best-looking film to me. It took everything that they have been incorporating with all of their films. Coco with its shadows, Inside Out with its bright, colorful, like, imaginative worlds, just everything. And then P Toy Story 4's, uh, like, just very in-depth, like, detailed look of just, like, cloth, wool, all that stuff. It took everything and put it into this movie, man. It's amazing. And Pete Docter, I mean, we talked about this in the review. He's one of the best directors there is when it comes to Pixar movies, but one of the best directors in general. This guy is outstanding when it comes to his works. Uh, as I was saying, this this is the one of the most beautiful looking films, and you can see it here on this screen that I'm showing. Uh, just so much detail, so much goes into this. Uh, and then finally, the last thing I'll say is, uh, you know, uh, Tina Fey and Jamie Foxx, they're great in the film. Uh, Jamie Foxx plays Joe, the guy who's trying to get back to Earth, uh, basically trying to get his soul back to his body. And 22 plays a soul who just doesn't find a purpose to living at all. And the, like we have one guy that wants to live because he's finally having the moment to shine compared to the one that doesn't want to live at all. And they have to work together in order to get there. Uh, and I also said in our review that you know, for a year where a lot of people were going not only through like midlife crises possibly, but also just the crisis of the unknown of what's going to happen next. And, you know, you, you, you have something in mind, what you want in your future and everything. Soul, I think, takes basically what a lot of people were going through 2020 and just perfectly captures in it in this beautiful family film. Uh, I've had little cousins watch it and everything and they liked it. But like you can tell that, yeah, this is definitely made more for older audiences it doesn't mean kids won't like it but as we said in our review the people in the back you're gonna love this way more than your kids that are gonna be sitting in front of you 
Uh, Soul to me was, I think, one of the two movies I gave four stars. I think Palm Springs was the other one. And, man, I absolutely loved it. It was my favorite film of 2020, and I can't wait to see what Pete Doctor does next. Yeah, Excellent dude. stuff. I like that uh, little intro you quipped there, too. I would also <laughs> add, I, the other thing I love is that you addressed, really almost took the words out of my mouth in terms of, like, how Pixar's been building this movie visually. Uh, and I, I would also throw into the other one I would add to that, and it's a common one that gets forgotten. I would say they showed off lighting and texture effects effectively for like, not the first time, obviously, but they showed real progress with it in Monsters University. Yeah. Being they a really college did. campus and everything like that, a picturesque sort of location. But yeah, I'm not going to disagree with a word you said about Soul. Dude, Pixar has been on an introspective kick lately with Inside Out and uh, Coco, and now Soul, which is the most introspective out of all of them, almost like cerebral, yeah. uh, out, but the most outwardly cerebral movie that they have yet. And it is, uh, it's, it's just beautiful to see it play out in such a, such a gorgeous manner, both visually and audibly. And it's, it's such a, it's such a, such a delight. Uh, but I will go to my number one, which is Bad Education. Bad education, Joe. My number <laughs> <laughs> the one I'm you sorry. turn into your number six for bad boys. That's the only reason why I'm on you for it. If it wasn't for that specific setup. But anyway, bad education by Corey Finley, available on a whole bunch of places. HBO Max, Hulu, Prime Video. This movie, it this is this is obviously my subjective opinion, but this movie is more watchable than even Palm Springs. And that's like a very rewatchable movie, probably because you're literally rewatching the movie as you go. But Bad Education. That's a hot take. Yeah. But Bad Education is so beautifully crafted and is one that you, <laughs> one that you need to watch again and you will understand more a second time. And unlike Tenet, you will enjoy it just as much the first time as well. Uh, which is a hot take. I promise I didn't set up beforehand, but yeah, dude, incredible performances. The pace is nonstop, but it's not in a way that's frenetic. Uh, not like Palm Springs where it feels a little bit more frenetic in that way or something like Borat, which is just keeps on hitting and hitting or even Hamilton, which is literally a musical uh, on, on stage. So that has to be by nature a lot uh, kind of strung together faster at a higher tempo, I should say. But Bad Education is very subtly fast-paced and you don't even realize it. The monologuing in here is so, and the writing that goes into the, that went into this film is so incredible. It's hard to overstate how well uh, uh, Hugh Jackman uh, nails this role as uh, the superintendent uh, uh, Frank Tassone. like he uh, and it, it's genius casting as well because Hugh Jackman is a you know a fan favorite in everything. Um, he's he's uh, you know besides Wolverine, uh, you know he you know particularly writing off of uh, the Greatest Showman. He has such a clean, such a likable. He's like the perfect man in many circles, right? You could you could make a case for that too. And on top of that, he was an educator. He I think he taught gym amongst he maybe me, other things. Yeah. yeah. So he's, you know, he's great with kids and he, he can relate to working with kids and being an educator. And he leverages that into his performance here as someone who is raised in a similar way or rather goes into like a similar situation, but has that seediness and has that delusions of grandeur. And it's so beautiful how much Frank Tassone, the character of Frank Tassone and the real life Frank Tassone desperately and masterfully clings onto that while not just wrestling with the characters and the web of lies and deceit, but also his own homosexuality, which man, this is a fantastic movie for LGBT representation uh, because, you know, this isn't the classic, you know, uh, you know, gay guy is the good guy and he gets picked on by the, uh, you know, heterosexual bullies in workplace or school. No, this is a character with depth and it is a, such a unique look. Because there is a degree here too, uh, uh, that angle of, of the, the being a gay man uh, within a position of power, uh, that even though he is, he is corrupted uh, by many other things and by his vanity and his and the wealth and the and the, and the power trip, 
it is so beautifully uh, the, the, his homosexuality is weaved into it as well. And amongst other things, my God, Allison Janey, just seeing her world uh, fall apart around her as well, much as we see it fall apart for Frank later. It is it is a, an entertaining double whammy of a fall of grace. The cinematography, the pacing, the angles, the uh, the performances, and my God, the 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 the, uh, the monologues and the writing is is top tier so happy to call it's my number one but you know what it all falls to the wayside by the best actor here joe jimmy tatro get my man jimmy tots there <laughs> as allison janey's son i was wondering he, why I'm, you had yo, this <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm memeing but like no joke when his part his very limited like 30 seconds of screen time i'm not joking when it when he was on there i was like holy shit this is the funniest thing i have seen yet in literal years just just like uh <laughs> just the juxtaposition and just his delivery is beautiful it is like i'm not joking this is like <laughs> this is a, this is a role that is like on par with <laughs> this is such a dumb take but like it's on par with um oh my god who plays donald trump on saturday night live Alec Baldwin. Alec Baldwin. Alec Baldwin. This is like Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross levels of this guy shows up, <laughs> does something, is hilarious, and leaves for the rest of the movie. Maybe not Oscar worthy, but like, uh, is I don't know. That's a dumb comparison, but a, a, dude, to a total like, surprise. Total surprise, dude. If you notice on the picture I took of Jimmy Tatro, you notice how I I screenshot it. Yeah. That's not available <laughs> yes. anywhere. I actually went back to the movie because I've rewatched it multiple times, but I went back to that scene and screenshot it because that face is so freaking perfect. It is. Oh my God. And the fact that this movie is based on, not even a novel, it's based on an article, on a magazine article, The Bad Superintendent by Robert Kolker. Any film that manages to create a good film, and in, in this case, a masterpiece, uh, out of a magazine article is fantastic. The only one I've ever uh, I've ever known that does that is uh, Saturday Night Fever, which is one of my favorite movies of all time with John Travolta. Uh, that's another one, but dude, this is just a masterclass in in so many things, and it's 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 it, it's it's perfect for me because it's got that element of intrepid uh, journalist reporter cracking open the story despite against the odds. You know that's my thing as well. So anyway, um, uh, bad education, good movie <laughs> number number one for me. Dom, two things: yeah. have you have you seen uh, American Vandal season one? No, no, I have not. Is okay, that, should, is that you my need wheelhouse? to go see that because it, it has your boy in it, and he's actually like a main character. And he's is he good? He's amazing in that. Dude, I'm so pro. I I don't even know him that well, but like the fact that he's a YouTube comedian, and that is already like a stigma, rightfully so by the track record we've seen. But the fact that he's a, he's a he's a YouTube comedian and he's nailing this this these roles apparently is fantastic yeah. I'm so you're giving it you're really giving off proud father vibes over <laughs> i here. am i so am no and then oh the other God. thing i wanted to mention was like bad education like this was i think it was like what our fourth or fifth review we did on sleepless when we, when we really? reviewed it it stuck with me through yeah. the year no it, it stuck Same. with me too and i was always like damn like um maybe this year is actually gonna be all right when it comes to movies because if bad <laughs> education was just an hbo release what about the actual stuff that was supposed to come to theaters that's coming to be on demand and the stuff that's slated for netflix and hulu like i'm like all right maybe we'll be fine and as the year went on we wore 